we're quite in an uncharted territory right now. I would say that, you know, if we're proceeding from our own old frame of mind, I would say a direct attack by Iran on Israel is quite impossible. But again, in the past six months, we have seen all sorts of red lines crossed. I'm Venetia Rainey, and this is Battle Lines. Regardless of who stands with Israel, Israel will fight until this battle is won. I made wartime decisions. I know the choices are never clear or easy for the leadership. I just find bombs and I find dead people, but it's a really scary thing for me. In this episode of Battle Lines, we speak to The Telegraph's Middle East correspondent, Natalia Vasilyeva, about President Joe Biden's warning that Iran may be planning a strike on Israel. Then our Asia correspondent, Nicholas Smith, explains why the rebels are winning the war in Myanmar. Finally, we catch up with Europe editor James Crisp about his interview with NATO's Deputy Secretary General. It's Friday, April 12th, 2024. First to Israel, where the country is in a state of high alert following a warning from Joe Biden that an Iranian strike may be imminent. I asked Natalia what the warning was about. Yeah, well, first we heard this warning was actually late, late Wednesday night from security sources who told the Bloomberg news agency that an Iranian attack directly on Israel was imminent. And this is about, I think it's exactly one week after Israel reportedly struck and destroyed the Iranian consulate in Damascus, killing a prominent Iranian commander. I'm saying reportedly because Israel has not claimed responsibility for that attack. Obviously, striking diplomatic property in another country would be a significant event, potentially triggering a war. So Israel never um, took responsibility for that, although it's very hard to imagine who else would have the capacity and the intent to um, carry out this strike. And we've heard in recent days from Iranian officials that they are preparing steps to retaliate. It's hard to underestimate the implications of that attack. The general who was killed is probably second in prominence only to Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general who was killed in an American airstrike in 2020. So that, that did look like a major escalation on the Israeli part. But the week has passed since the attack and we have not seen any significant attempts on from Iran or its proxies to retaliate. So I would say that by, by the end of the first week, everyone sort of forgot about it and moved on. And then security sources and President Biden came out with this intelligence saying that an attack is actually imminent, that Iran and or its proxies are preparing for what they described a significant attack. And here in Israel, the the air force of the Israeli defense forces has been on um, high alert since the um, attack on the Iranian consulate um, in Damascus. Um, we heard last week that reservists um, serving in air defense units have uh, been called back um, for duty presumably to be ready and in their positions to to man the missile defense when or if there, there is such an attack from Iran. Again, as if Thursday morning, it's all fairly quiet in Israel. And we have yet to see what happens to that warning about an Iranian strike on Israel. Of course, I have to tread a bit carefully here. So anything could happen in the next 24 hours, I suppose. But assuming that it is still the same tomorrow morning when our listeners hear this as when I'm speaking to you now on Thursday morning. Isn't the chance of Iran striking into Israel, the country, directly quite unlikely, given that Iran normally likes to respond on exactly the same level as it's been attacked? An Israel at- attack was on Iran's embassy but in Syria. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And if we spoke a couple of months ago, I would definitely say that Iran would be on the cautious side, that Iran would not cross this line attacking Israel. I've heard from people both in Iran and elsewhere in the Middle East that despite the rhetoric, Iranian authorities are keenly aware of potential fallout from a major regional war that they definitely would not want any hostilities on on their territory. That's why attacking Israel would be essentially provoking a response onto Iranian territory. Again, what really struck me in, in that warning from President Biden is that it was not specific. He didn't say that the attack was imminent within, say, 24 hours, but it was quite specific that he mentioned 
it would be missiles or drones, and they would be attacked by Iran or Iranian proxies. I think it's quite significant that American officials are mentioning that an Iraq by um, an attack by Iran itself on Israel is possible. This is not something we have not seen it at all in the past six months since the war in Gaza, since the war in Gaza started. So we're quite in an uncharted territory right now. I would say that you know if we're proceeding from our own old frame of mind, I would say a direct attack by Iran on Israel is quite impossible. But again, in the past six months, we have seen all sorts of um, red lines crossed, including Hamas attacking Israel all of a sudden on a Sabbath in the biggest attack on Israel since essentially the, the beginning of the state of Israel. So we need to wait and see what happens. Yeah, that's a really good point. So what, um, we're in the sort of realm of a hypothesis here, but indulge me, what sort of potential flashpoints or, or methods or routes of attack would Israel be preparing for at this point? You mentioned proportionality and the fact that Israel reportedly, it was reportedly Israel that struck a struck the Iranian consulate in Damascus and it would make would sort of make sense for Iran to retaliate in kind as in target a in target Israeli representatives or Israeli diplomats abroad in a third country. So that is still very much a possibility. We've heard quite for some time that embassy staff, Israeli embassy staff abroad has been on high alert for for a while. Apparently they have adopted a new security protocol and basically they are expecting an imminent attack on them. I would say an an, an Israeli mission elsewhere whatever it means, an Israeli mission in a third country would be the the prime, the most logical target for Iran, so to speak. Also, there are there are various scenarios. There are scenarios of a an unusually significant attack from from Hezbollah, um, Iran's proxy, on the north of Israel. We know that they so far have been fairly restrained. The daily, the near daily clashes that we've seen along the um, Lebanese Israeli borders have been relentless, but they have been fairly contained. So all of the exchange of fire has essentially been hap- happening within something like five five kilometers deep into each of the country it was not there was not much there were no far reaching attacks except for Israel occasionally striking deep into Lebanese territory so there's a possibility of Hezbollah going ahead with a high impact on further than the border areas that would mean Haifa the biggest city in Israel's north one of the some of the concerns that I heard before actually way before the attack on the Iranian consulate was that in case there's a, an all-out war with, with Hezbollah, Israelis were worried that their power grid would be under attack and most of Israel's power generation is concentrated in the center and in the north, so closer closer to where Hezbollah is based. So that would also be a prime target. What we also heard last night from unnamed officials was that Iran would be targeting military and government buildings, as they put it. That presumably would not, would not include station. Obviously, the biggest price for Iran, if it wanted to strike a military target, would be Kiria, the headquarters of the IDF, which is based in Tel Aviv. That would be the most logical targets. And in terms of government buildings, if you're talking about any ministry, any Israeli ministry, they are mostly based in Jerusalem. So far, my understanding is that if we go by what's been happening in, in previous conflicts and escalations in the Middle East, Israel's adversaries tend not to target Jerusalem because it's essentially a divided city. It's a home to a large Palestinian population in East Jerusalem. And it's also home to Al-Aqsa, one of the, one of the holiest sites in Islam. And I guess no one really wants to risk getting it damaged, just despite the fact that when the war between Hamas and Israel broke out, we had several air raids here and there were several attacks on Israel in the past six months. Does Iran or its proxies have the capabilities to strike Tel Aviv? They definitely do. And I think as a recognition of that, as early as mid next week, I think we heard that GPS signal was getting jammed in both northern Israel and in the center in Tel Aviv. There were reports of essentially chaos on the roads, delivery guys not being able to carry out orders and sort of companies reliant on, on GPS having a real trouble. And I think that's one of the uh, major signs that Israel takes that risk very seriously. And if we talk about precision missiles, which is what Iran has, it, it has the, the, the capability to, to reach a target in Israel 
how the Iron Dome defense system will operate, how we will respond, it remains to be seen because so far in the past six months of the war with Hamas, Israel has dealt with, especially in the first few months, with quite heavily barrages of rockets. But all of those rockets were, if not old, but they were fairly clunky and low tech. And that made them quite easy to shoot down. It's probably not going to be the case with Iran or with Hezbollah, which is, which I believe to be more technologically sophisticated and which are believed to have a more sophisticated selection of arms and missiles at, at their disposal. I want to go in a completely opposite direction for a second, also hypothetical. If nothing does happen, if we don't see Iran respond in any major way like you've just outlined, how can we explain this warning from the US? Is it possible there are other politics, other agendas at play? That's a very good question, actually. And you know what? As soon as I heard this warning, I had a massive flashback to days before the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022, when American officials first through American media and later on the record, they issued warnings of an upcoming invasion saying that Russia is about to launch airstrikes on Ukraine. And it was, was going to happen in 48 hours, then 24 hours. And at that time, those warnings were very precise. I would say they were still very hard to believe because no one could imagine that, that, that Russia would go to the suicidal war and would actually go ahead with what Americans have been warning us about. But compared to that, the warning that we heard from President Biden was not that specific. It, it said that Iran is, is preparing to launch an airstrike. It, you know, which means that, you know, there might be some mediators coming in. We know that there was a bit of a, you know, there was a flurry of diplomatic activities, activity between countries in the Middle East and Iran, sort of going between the United States and Iran, apparently trying to calm everyone down. So that, that didn't, they didn't sound as specific to me as in Ukraine to think that this is absolutely imminent and this is absolutely going to happen in the next couple of days. One of the purposes of, of calling Iran out on, on the US part would be uh, would be to prevent this attack. And as far as we know now, now that uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is in its third year, the reason why Americans were leaking that information about the invasion and later going on public was exactly that. They were hoping that they would discourage Russia from invading and that they would pile international pressure on Russia and by publicizing those plans. It didn't work in Russia's case, but it looks like if this is the plan, Americans are still hoping that it might work with Iran this time. Thank you so much for joining us. That was Natalia Vasilyeva, a Middle East correspondent from Jerusalem. Now to Myanmar, where a loose coalition of rebels are making gains against the country's ruling junta. This week, the resistance seized the key border trading town of Mayawadi from the military. I spoke to our Asia correspondent, Nicholas Smith, to find out more. The story of the civil war in Myanmar is something that you've been covering for several years. This week, there have been some quite interesting developments. Do you want to bring us up to date about what's been happening? Sure. Thanks for having me on. So if we look at the immediate news of the past few days, and then we can put it into a bit of context, the Myanmar military is on the verge of losing a key border town, Miawadi, which is in Karen State in the east, and it sits on the border with Thailand. It sits on a major trade route, and it also hosts several key military bases, including one that the military has used as its regional headquarters for the past almost three decades. And it's currently besieged by the Karen National Liberation Army, which is the, a militia that uh, claims to represent the Karen minority who live in Karen state. And so in, in the past few days, we have heard reports of hundreds uh, of, of soldiers, of officers and their families who have been evacuated. And um, it looks like the town is on the verge of falling to this ethnic armed group, which would be a significant loss. And to put it in context, 
this is this comes on the back of a, a of a huge wave of resistance that has been sweeping the country since last October. This is one of a series of major defeats for Myanmar's military. They have also lost strategic towns on the border with China and with India, as well as hundreds of bases. And we've seen since last October, we've seen unprecedented coordination between ethnic armed groups across the country from the Thai to the Chinese to the Indian border, as well as uh, people's defence forces, which are more ad hoc armed resistance groups that have formed since the coup in 2021. And so this operation, it's been called Operation 1027 after the date that it was launched by three different rebel groups. They came together in Shan State in the north and they launched this surprise offensive that has really put the military on the back foot. And it has been widely described by analysts as one of the, the biggest challenges to the military's rule since it seized power in the 2021 coup. What precipitated these various resistant groups and rebel organisations finally coming together and pooling their resources and strength? Well, the military has ruled with absolute brutality since it seized power from the democratically elected government in February. 20. In 2020, the National League for Democracy, the party of Aung San Suu Kyi, won a huge majority in the parliament. The military claimed that this was um, done under fraudulent means and then took power in a surprise coup in February 2020. 21. There was a huge uprising in the country against this, and the military cracked down with severity. It, it has killed thousands of people since it, it opened fire on democratic protesters. It, it has also committed terrible atrocities in border regions against ethnic minorities and waged a very violent air campaign. It has been bombing civilians. And for the past three years, there have been flare-ups of fighting between different rebel groups and the military, as well as civilians who have come together to form these people's defence forces and they've been fighting against officials in the cities. They have been, each group has been conducting its own form of resistance. But what appears to have galvanised the country is this operation that was launched in October uh, last year. And this began in Shan State. It began between three different groups. They're called the Three Bro Brotherhood Alliance, and these were well-established ethnic armed organizations. So th this, this alliance came together in a surprise attack on the military, and they were successful. They immediately overran hundreds of bases. The military, it turned out, was already very demoralized. It was lacking resources. It was lacking weapons. And when the rest of the country saw that this alliance was doing very well in Shan State, it seemed to galvanize them. And so it really snowballed and people started to come together. They started to see this as a possible turning point in the civil war and a, a possible opening for them to eventually defeat the military. And, and nobody thinks that the military is at the point of imminent collapse, but this is certainly a point where it, it is on the back foot, it is struggling to contain this wave of resistance and it is looking much more weakened than, than it ever has been. You mentioned the Three Brothers Alliance. What do we know about these groups? Do they all have very similar aims and MOs or is it really a sort of ragtag band of people who are united for the moment in trying to depose the hunter but afterwards will probably want lots of different things if there is an afterwards? Myanmar has been riven with conflict for decades since it gained independence from the UK in 1948. So you have a mixture now of very well-established ethnic armed organisations, who some of whom for decades have been fighting for self-determination for their states. Violence and conflicts has flared up in cycles over different years. Since the coup, however, what you've seen is more coordination between these groups and also more ad hoc, ragtag rebel groups of civilians who are just completely sickened by what the military has been doing and the coup. And, and so 
in a sense, there has been a lot more unity against the military because the country was so shocked. The country was kind of in the early forms of democracy. It, it was experiencing democratic elections. The young, they came of age as Aung San Suu Kyi had come to power and they had real hopes for the future that they could put military rule and mi- military dictatorship behind them. And so everybody was so taken aback and really shocked by the coup in 2021. And this has given them a sense of unity. I would say, though, that the ethnic armed groups, they do still have their own objectives. It, it will be a long road for the country to come together. If the military does fall, it will not be easy for Myanmar to find a unified future. And so you have at the moment the National Unity Government, which formed after the coup. It's made up of uh, politicians who were elected and then ousted, also some ethnic minority leaders and activists. And so what they are saying is that they, their ultimate aim is to create a federal democracy. But there's, there's a really long road ahead if the country wants to achieve that. And, and the, the military is still, d- despite seeing s- serious attrition over the past uh, few months and also losing a lot of its resources, it's really struggling on multiple battlefronts. Despite this, it is still clinging to power. So we're really not seeing the collapse of the military, military regime yet. These sort of clashes I've been seeing, as you say, they are still really significant, aren't they? And I think last week we saw a wave of drone attacks on the capital, a heavily fortified capital, and we haven't seen anything like that before. Is that right? There were reports of a similar drone attack in September, but that really went under the radar. And and so last week we did hear of an alliance of rebel groups staging a rare drone attack on the capital. And again, this was another embarrassing blow to military because this is one of the most fortified locations in the country and the national unity government claimed that 29 drones had been deployed the military said that it had shot down at least seven of them it's it's unclear what damage the drones did the the NUG claimed that they were armed with explosives we haven't seen any evidence of damage or casualties as a result but they claimed that these drones were launched against the army headquarters and airbase and the airport. And so really, it is, uh, it's definitely a propaganda victory for the resistance groups. It again shows that the military has been weakened by this real strong surge of resistance. And it could, we could be looking at a new tactic as well by the resistance. It was said to have been carried out by one specialised unit called the Cloud Team, who are looking at drone warfare and how it can be used. And we have seen in cases like Ukraine, where drones have been used effectively against a very powerful enemy, where forces have shown that even if they're outgunned, that they can be innovative with drones to really inflict damage on the enemy. So this is definitely a strategy that the Myanmar resistance appeared to be looking at, and I'm sure we'll see a lot more of it. They seem to be more and more determined to use whatever means they have at their disposal to to defeat the, the Myanmar military. They're definitely making an impact on it. We've seen so much attrition over the past a few months. And we've seen videos of rebels using things like catapults to launch sticks of dynamite and just do anything that they can to try and inflict as much damage as they can on the military. And they have so far overrun hundreds of bases. We've heard multiple reports of soldiers surrendering because they have been outnumbered by the rebels. They haven't been given the backup that they needed from the central command. They're they're struggling to even have enough food, food and water. They're very demoralised and they're running out of ammunition. Yeah, manpower is an issue that you've written about quite a few times and the Myanmar military is just or is on the cusp of introducing conscription. What kind of effect is that having on the ground? Have they managed to sign many people up? It's really unclear how many people they've managed to sign up. There's been a huge 
amount of pushback against this. First of all, we have seen the opposition NUG claims that tens of thousands have fled the military already. So when I spoke to an NUG leader in, in December, his estimation was that fifteen to 16,000 soldiers had fled the army since the start of the coup. And, and that has only increased since the launch of Operation 1027. So in February, the military announced a nationwide draft and they were using a 2010 law, the People's Military Service Law, that they activated under the current state of emergency. This means that all men aged 18 to 35 and women aged 18 to 27 must serve for up to two years. And specialists like engineers and doctors who are under the age of 45 must serve for three years. So the military initially said that they aim to draft 60,000 people in the first year. And they're talking about bringing on board 5,000 each month. The reaction was visceral against it. So young people were queuing up outside the Thai embassy. They were trying to get visas. They were trying to get passports. There were two people who were actually crushed to death at the passport office as the crowds just surged there to try and get documents to leave. The Thai authorities initially said they would grant only 400 visas a day. They've upped that to 800, but the appointments are reportedly full for weeks. So that just shows how many people are trying to flee. You also have people who are turning to smugglers to get them out. There are reports that it's, it costs about $1,200 to be smuggled across the border into Thailand. Many others are also joining resistance groups, armed resistance groups, because they have so little choice. They, they feel that if they are presented with conscription and being forced to fight with the military, then they'd rather go and join the resistance groups or they'd rather go into hiding. And just today, Human Rights Watch put out a report saying that over 1,000 Rohingya men and boys have been forced into the army using this conscription law that only applies to Myanmar citizens and the Rohingya aren't even offered citizenship by Myanmar. So it's a really egregious move. This is a minority that have been severely persecuted by the Myanmar military to the point when in 2017 the, the UN accused the military of, of a genocidal campaign against them and there were many atrocities have com- been committed against the Rohingya by, by the Myanmar military. The military is also, as I mentioned before, it's disintegrating from within. So we have spoken to several deserters in the pa- over the past few months who've described to us what it's been like to, to be besieged by rebels and just essentially left to die by their senior officers who have not given them the backup. And we also spoke to one helicopter pilot who'd been with the military for some 20 years and he had fled after the coup. He tried to avoid duty and he tried to just stick to construction activities and not fly helicopters for the military. And he was threatened with about 20 years in jail if he didn't carry out his duty. So he also fled to Thailand and, and he told us that uh, many inside the military, just they don't respect the leadership and they don't want to serve under them. So it, it seems a lot of people have been trapped into the military and many are looking for a way out. One final question. Our listeners will be very familiar with the former leader of Myanmar. And where is she in all of this? Obviously still jailed, but is she vocal about supporting anything or is she just completely silent at the moment? She has been silenced. Nobody has contact with her. And so she was jailed on the first day of the coup in February 2021. And she has been slapped with multiple charges, some of them as ludicrous as possessing a walkie-talkie. She is currently facing the rest of her life in jail, and even her lawyer has struggled to speak with her. He has been banned from speaking with her. Her son has and her family, they have also not been able to communicate with her. She's essentially been held incommunicado, but members of her fam or members of her party have been very vocal and have stepped up to lead the resistance movement 
and to form plans for the future of the country and to restore democracy there. Thank you so much for joining us. That's Nicola Smith, our Asia correspondent. Lastly, we hear from our Europe editor, James Crisp, about his interview with Deputy Secretary General for NATO about the situation in Ukraine and what a second term for Donald Trump would mean for the alliance. Thanks so much for joining us on Battle Lines, James. You interviewed Mircea Joanna, the Deputy Secretary General for NATO this week. What did he tell you? I suppose the first thing that we talked about was really what's hanging over uh, Ukraine and Europe as well, the the possibility of a second Donald Trump term and what that might mean for NATO and for NATO's support for Ukraine. You may remember that Donald Trump, when he was president the first time around, had quite a testy relationship with the alliance. He would regularly upbraid his European allies for not meeting their defence spending targets. Uh, I was based in Brussels at the time. I, I well remember the sort of the somewhat shell-shocked look on some of the diplomats as they wandered around the summit floor. It looks like there is a possibility, I suppose, that that Mr. Trump could be coming back to the White House. And he said a few things on the campaign trail which have kind of really made Europeans quite anxious. For example, he said that he would let Russia do whatever the hell they want with any NATO ally who doesn't meet their NATO spending target, which is 2% of economic output. Now. Our listeners will be well aware that NATO members have been very bad at meeting that target. In fact, in February, the alliance said 18 of its members had hit the target, which was a record. Given that there are 32 members of this alliance, that's clearly not good enough. So in terms of a broader context, we have Republicans in Congress at the moment blocking a $60 billion aid package to Ukraine as well. The lack of that aid is bound to have consequences on the battlefield for Kyiv. So what we have is a man coming in who has undermined the alliance in the past, will at the very least make some sort of demands of it, ahead of a party which doesn't think that Europe is doing enough to help Ukraine, which is, after all, a war in Europe's backyard, not in America's backyard. So that's the context. Now, as you'd expect, the Deputy Secretary General may put a kind of a positive spin on this. He said that on aggregate, European nations were meeting the 2% target. He said that they all plan to meet it in the very near future. But to be frank, they've been saying that for years and years. He also said that Trump, by the end of his first sort of four or five years in office, had kind of softened towards NATO. Let's see how that pans out if the US president wins the next election. He did make the point, I think an interesting point, that Europe had been very bad at communicating how much it was doing to support Kiev. He used the example of Iceland, which doesn't have an army, and how they were helping with cargo and other sort of supplies to say that things weren't quite as simple as, say, I don't know, a billionaire populist on the campaign trail might paint them to be. I think what is clear is that there are and there have been longstanding anxieties about the kind of the threat of a Trump presidency. I and mean, never fear, really, that Washington could withdraw from the security umbrella, which has guaranteed peace in most of Europe ever since the Second World War. That's an issue that you've been looking at quite a lot, isn't it? We've got European elections coming up in June, mm. and there are a fair few far-right parties that are set to do reasonably well that agree with Donald Trump that Europe should stop arming Ukraine and should, you know, take a step back and allow peace talks to take place? Yeah, I mean, look, we're talking here. I mean, basically, these are sort of quizzling parties, you know, these are people who believe that the future of the world is Europe being squashed between powerful autocratic nations like China, Russia. The best thing to do is essentially to give in to these bully boys or accept the geopolitical reality and basically sacrifice Ukraine in the interest of continuing to get cheap Russian gas. As you can probably tell from my tone, I don't agree with that. 
But, you know, I don't happen to lead a far-right European party. But I'm also not going to come first or second in the European Parliament election. So, yeah, it is a case that there is a kind of increased war weariness in some countries. We've seen that with recent electoral victories in Slovakia. But, I mean, it's not just Slovakia. I mean, Bilder's in the Netherlands. He's extremely Russian-friendly in a country which he lost hundreds of its nationals when the MH17 plane was downed over Ukraine those years ago. But he would look for a more sort of pragmatic relationship. He doesn't want to send weapons to what Ukraine. He thinks they should be kept in the Netherlands. I think we're talking about nine in nine countries, these sort of Russian-friendly hard-right parties are, are predicted to win. France being one of the ones which is they try very hard to distance themselves, but you can't go around for years and years saying Putin is great and then all of a sudden go, oh, actually, we didn't really mean that. Uh, treat that with a, a large pinch of salt. You mentioned Russia and China, and those are two countries that Mr. Joanna also mentioned. He said that as much as Europe needs America, America needs Europe. What did he mean by that? Well, I think it's kind of a, quite a clever way to sort of reframe the dominant political narrative, which is that Europe is uh, screwed if the US pulls out. This is actually, to a certain extent, an alliance which is to the US's benefit, as opposed to just being a drain on its resources. His view, and it's a view which is quite sort of increasingly widely shared, is that basically the world will remember that there was a time when history was meant to be over. But after the Cold War, the age of the big power blocks facing off against each other, all of that sort of disappeared and we were all going to live happily ever after. Now, unfortunately, reality hasn't quite panned out like that. And we have a situation where you have these big superpowers like Russia, China. Then you also have countries like Belarus, minions of these big countries. I mean, arguably, Russia is now a minion of China. North Korea, Iran, I mean, if we wanted to make it really simple, the baddies. So you have the the axis of the baddies. They are, according to the NATO Secretary, Deputy Secretary General, they are basically intensively and aggressively trying to challenge the international world order which was set up after World War II. They are putting forward a competing ideology, a competing worldview based on Again, the autocratic strongman rather than a Western democracy. And this is an epic struggle. And it's sort of filtering through in a lot of ways, actually, after uh, the Hamas attack on Israel. And it wasn't long before Hamas rocked up in Moscow, which I think caused quite a bit of um, surprise. He sees a threat from Russia and China, which will actively seek to disrupt American interests. And in that conflict, America, no matter how powerful it is, and of course it is powerful, will need allies. And we'll need allies like Britain. We'll need allies like Norway, Iceland, Germany, France, Canada, Turkey. We'll need NATO, basically. This isn't just, he didn't say this, but it has been pointed out. There's only been one nation which has triggered the Article 5 clause. All members of the alliance rushed to the defense of one member which comes under attack, and that was the US after 9-11. So I guess his point is that this isn't all a one-way relationship, but Europe has its part to play, and Europe has been contributing to Ukraine. We'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining us, James Crisp, our Europe editor. That's all for Battle Lines this time. Please join us again next week for more of The Telegraph's best foreign reporting. Goodbye. Battle Lines is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our news, analysis and dispatches from around the world, subscribe to The Telegraph or sign up to Dispatches, which brings stories from our award-winning correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a live blog on our website where you can follow updates on Israel and Gaza as they come in throughout the day, including insight from contributors to this podcast. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Battle Lines on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it really helps others find the show. As disinformation is a particular problem during conflict, we are relying on your support more than ever. Battle Lines is part of wider Telegraph foreign coverage in our podcasts. 
If you're interested in finding out more about the war in Ukraine, you can listen to our sister podcast, Ukraine the Latest. Battle Lines is produced by David Dagahi and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.